Hello everyone and welcome to the Library of Arbalorn. I'm your host Tabby and today we're going to be reading chapter 5 of First King of Shannara. Let's begin. They rose before sunrise and walked east through the day until sunset. They passed along the base of the dragon's teeth above the Myrmidon, keeping back within the shadow of the mountains. Bremen warned them that they were at risk even there. The skull bearers felt sure enough of themselves to come down out of the Northland. The warlock lord marched his armies east toward the Janison Pass, which meant they probably intended to descend upon the Eastland. If they were bold enough to invade the country of the dwarves, they certainly would not hesitate to venture into the borderlands. So they kept close watch of the skies and the darker valleys and rifts of the mountains where the shadows left the rock cloaked in perpetual night. And they did not take anything for granted as they journeyed on. But the winged hunters did not show themselves this day, and aside from a few travelers glimpsed at a distance in the forests and plains south, they saw no one. They stopped to rest and to eat, but did not pause otherwise, keeping a steady pace through the daylight hours. By sunset, they had reached the foothills, leading up into the Valley of Shell and the Hadeshorn. They camped in a draw that faced back toward the plain south and the winding blue ribbon of the Myrmidon, where it branched east into the Rab. The river gradually diminishing until it died away into streams and ponds on the barren flats. They cooked vegetables and a rabbit that Tay had killed and ate their dinner while it was still light, the sun bleeding red and gold into the western horizon. Bremen told them they would go up into the mountains after midnight and wait for the slow hours before sunrise when the spirits of the dead could be summoned. They kicked out the fire at night, descended, as night descended, and rolled into their cloaks to get what sleep they could. Did not worry so, Kinsen. Bremen whispered to the border man, once in passing, on seeing his face. But the advice was wasted. Kins and Ravenlock had been to the Hayton before and knew what to expect. Sometime after midnight, Bremen took them up into the foothills, fronting the dragon's teeth where the Valley of Shell was nestled. They climbed through the rocks on a night so black that they could barely make out the person immediately ahead. Clouds had moved in after sunset, thick and low and threatening, and all signs of moon and stars had disappeared hours ago. Bremen led the way cautiously, concerned for their well-being, even though the terrain they passed through was as familiar to him as the back of his hand. He did not speak to the others as they proceeded, keeping his attention focused on the task at hand and the one that lay ahead, intent on avoiding any missteps either now or later, for a meeting with the dead required foresight and caution, a screening up of courage and a hardening of determination that would permit neither hesitation nor doubt. Once contact was made, even the smallest distraction could be life-threatening. It was still several hours before dawn when they reached their destination. They paused on the rim of the valley and stared down into its broad, shallow bowl. Crushed rock littered its sides, black and glistening even in the deep gloom, reflecting back the strange light of the lake. The haze horn sat at the center of the bowl, broad and opaque, its still flat surface glimmering with some inner radiance as if the lake's soul pulsed within its depths. It was still and lifeless within the valley of shale, empty of movement, devoid of sound. It had the look and feel of a black hole, an eye looking down into the world of the dead. We will wait here, Bremen advised, seating himself on the flat surface of a low boulder, his cloak wrapped about his thin frame like a shroud. The others nodded, but stood staring down into the valley for a time, unwilling to turn away just yet. Bremen let them be. They were feeling the weight of the valley's oppressive silence. Only Kinson had been here before, and even he could not prepare himself for what he must be feeling now. Bremen understood. The hate's horn was the promise of what awaited them all. It was a glimpse into the future they could not escape. A frightening, dark look into life's end. It spoke in no recognizable words, but only in whispers and small mutterings. It revealed too little to give insight and just enough to give pause. 
The old man had been here twice now, and each time he had come away forever changed. There were truths to be learnt, and there was wisdom to be gained from a meeting with the dead, but there was a price to be paid as well. You could not brush up against the future and escape unscathed. You could not see into the forbidden and avoid damage to your sight. Bremen remembered the feeling of those previous meetings. He remembered the cold that had worked its way down into his bones and would not leave for weeks afterward. He remembered his pervasive longing for what he had missed in the years gone past that could never be raptured, recaptured. He was frightened even now of the possibility that somehow he would stray from the narrow path permitted him in making this forbidden contact and be swallowed up in the void, a creature consigned to a limbo existence between life and death, neither all or of one or the other. But the need to discover what he could of how the warlock war might be destroyed, of the choice and opportunities upon open to him in his effort to save the races, and of the secrets of the past and future hidden to the living but revealed to the dead, far outweighed fear and doubt. He was compelled so fiercely by his need that he was forced to act on it even at the risk of his own well-being. Yes, there were dangers in making this contact. Yes. He would not emerge from it unharmed, but it did not matter in the scheme of things, for even giving up his life was an acceptable price if it meant putting an end to his implacable enemy. The others had forced themselves away from the volley's realm and drifted over to sit with him. He made himself smile reassuringly at them, one by one, beckoning even the recalcitrant Kinson to come close. In the hour before dawn. I will go down into the volley, he told them quietly. Once there, I will summon the spirits of the dead and ask them to show me something of the future. I will ask them to reveal the secrets that could, that would help us in our efforts to destroy the warlock lord. I will ask them to give up any magic that might aid us. I must do this quickly and all within that short span of time before the sun rises. You will wait here for me. You will not come down to the valley, whatever happens. You will not act on what you see, even though it might seem as if you must. Do nothing but wait. Perhaps one of us should go with you, Riska offered bluntly. There is safety in numbers, even with the dead. If you can speak with their spirits, so can we. We are druids all, save the border man. That you are, Druids, does not matter, Bremen said at once. It is too dangerous for you. This is something I must do alone. You will wait here. I want your promise, Riska. The dwarf gave him a long, hard look and then nodded. Bremen turned to the others, each nodding, nodded reluctantly in turn. Marif's eyes met his own and held them with secret understanding. You are convinced this is necessary, Kinsen pressed softly. The lines of Bremen's aged face crinkled slightly deeper with the furrowing of his brow. If I could think of something else to do, something that would aid us, I would leave this place. I am no fool, Kenson, nor hero. I know what coming here means. I know it damages me. Then perhaps, but the dead speak to me as the living cannot, Bremen continued, cutting him short. We need their wisdom and insight. We need their visions, flawed and bereft of understanding as they sometimes are. He took a deep breath. We need to see through their eyes. If I must give up something of myself to gain that insight, then so be it. They were silent then, lost in their separate thoughts, mulling over his words and the misgivings they, they generated. But there was no help for it. He had told them what was necessary, and there was nothing else to say. They would understand better, perhaps, when this matter was done. So he sat in the darkness and glanced surreptitiously at the shimmering surface of the lake. Their faces bathed in the weak light as they listened to the silence and waited for the dawn to draw closer. And when at last it did, when it was time to go, Bremen rose and faced his companions with a small smile, then went past them wordlessly and down into the valley of shale. Once more, his progress was slow. He had come this way 
before, but familiarity did not aid where the terrain was so treacherous. The rock underneath was slippery and loose at every point, and the edges were sharp enough to cut. He picked his way carefully, testing each step on the uncertain surface. His boots crunched and ground on the rock, the sound echoing in the deep silence from west where the clouds massed thickest. Thunder rumbled ominously, signaling the approach of a storm. Within the valley, there was no wind, but the smell of rain permeated the dead air. Bremen glanced up as a flicker of lightning splintered the black skies. Then repeated its pattern further north against the backdrop of the mountains. Dawn would bring more than the sunrise this day. He reached the bottom of the valley and slogged forward at a more rapid pace. His footing steadier on the level ground, ahead the haze horn glimmered with silvery incandescence, the light reflecting from somewhere below its flat, still surface. He could not smell death. He could smell death here, an unmistakable mustiness, an arid and fatigued decay. He was tempted to look back to where the others waited, but knew he must not distract himself, even in that small way. He was already running through the ritual he must follow when he reached the lake's shore. The words, the signs, the conjuring acts that would bring the dead to speak with him. He was already hardening himself against their debilitating presence. All too soon he stood against he stood upon the edge of the lake, a frail, small figure in a vast arena of rock and sky, all withered skin and old bones, the strongest part of him his determination, his stubborn will. Before him, he could hear again the rumble of thunder from the approaching storm. Overhead, the clouds began to roil, stirred to movement by the winds that bore on their back the coming rain. Below, he could feel the earth shiver as the spirit sensed his presence. He spoke to them softly, calling out his name, his history, his reason for coming to speak with them. He made the signs with his arms and hands, made the gestures that would summon them from the world of the dead to the world of the living. He saw the waters begin to stir in response, and he quickened his pace. He was confident and steady. He knew what would follow. First came the whispers, soft and distant, rising like invisible bubbles from the waters. Then came the cries, long and deep. The cries increased in volume, growing from a few to many, rising in tenor and impatience. The waters of the haze horn hissed with dissatisfaction and need and began to roil as rapidly as the clouds overhead, stirred by their own coming storm. Bremen gestured to them, bade them respond. The learning he had mastered in his studies with the elves buttressed and enabled him. A bedrock on which to build the summoning magic. Answer me. Answer me, he called to them. Open to me. Spray flew out of the center of the now violent waters, rising in a mountain, collapsing back, rising again. A rumble sounded deep within the earth, a groan of dissatisfaction. Bremen felt the first trace of doubt steal into his heart, and it was with an effort that he forced himself to ignore it. He could feel a vacuum forming around him, spreading out from the lake to encompass the whole of the valley. Only the dead would be allowed within its perimeter, the dead and the one who summoned them. Then the spirits began to rise from the lake, small, white, filaments of light given vaguely human form, bodies bathed in a firefly radiance that glimmered against the blackness of the clouded night. The spirit spiraled out of the mist and spray, snake-like, lifting from the dark, dead air of their afterlife home to visit briefly the world they had once inhabited. Bremen kept his arms raised in a warding gesture, feeling vulnerable and bereft of power. Though he had done the summoning, though he had brought the spirits to life, cold ran down his brittle limbs and a rush of ice water through his veins. He held himself firm against the fear that raced through him, against the whispers that asked accusingly, who calls us? Who dares? 
Then something huge broke the water's surface at its exact center. A black cloaked figure that dwarfed the smaller glowing forms, scattering them into with its coming, soaking up their fragile light and leaving them whirling and twisting like leaves in the wind. The cloaked figure rose to stand upon the dark churning waves of the hate's horn, only vaguely substantial, a wraith without flesh or bones, yet a firmer stuff than the smaller creatures it dominated. Bremen held himself steady as the dark figure advanced. This was whom he had come to see. This was the one he had summoned. Yet he was no longer certain he had done the right thing. The cloaked form slowed so close now that it blotted out the sky above and the volley behind. Its hood lifted and there was no face, no sign of anything within the dark robes. It spoke and its voice was a rumble of discontent. Do you know me? Flat, dispassionate, and empty, a question without a question's inflection. The words hung upon the silence in a lingering echo. Bremen nodded slowly in response. I do, he whispered. At the rim of the valley, the four he had left behind watched the drama unfold. They saw the old man stand upon the shores of the haze horn and summon the spirits of the dead. They saw the spirits rise amid the roar of the waters, saw their glowing forms, the movement of their arms and legs, the twisting of their bodies, and a macabre dance of momentary freedom. They watched as the huge black robed form lifted from their midst, enveloping them in its wake. Absorbing their light, they watched the figure advance to stand before Bremen, but they could hear nothing of what they saw. Within the valley, all was silent. The sounds of the lake and the spirits were closed away. The voices of the druid and the cloaked figure, if they spoke, were inaudible. They could hear only the wind that rushed past their ears and the beginning pattern of raindrops on the crushed stone. The expected storm was breaking. Rolling out of the west in a mass of dark clouds ascending on them with sheets of rain. It reached them at the same moment the cloaked figure reached Bremen, and it swallowed everything in an instant's time. The lake, the spirits, the cloaked figure, Bremen, the whole of the valley, all were gone in the blink of an eye. Riska growled in dismay and glanced quickly at the others. They were cloaked now against the storm, hunched down within their coverings, like crones bent with age. Can you see? he demanded anxiously. Nothing. Tay Treffenwade answered at once. They're gone. For a moment, no one moved uncertain what they should do. Kinsen peered through the downpours, haze, trying to distinguish something of the shapes he thought he could just make out. But everything was shadowy and surreal, and there was no chance of making sure from what they stood. He may be in trouble, Riska snapped accusingly. He told us to wait, Kinsen forced himself to say, not wanting to be reminded of the old man's instructions when he feared so for him, but not willing to ignore his promise either. Rain blew into their faces in sudden gusts, choking them. He is all right. Marif cried out suddenly, her hand brushing the air before her face. They stared at her. You can see them? Riska demanded. She nodded, her face lowered in shadow. Yes. But she could not. Kinsen was closest to her and saw what the others missed. If she was seeing Bremen, it was not through her eyes. Her eyes, he realized in shock, had turned white. Within the valley of shale, no rain fell, no wind blew, nothing of the storm penetrated. There was, for Bremen, no sense of anything beyond the lake and the dark figure that stood upon it before him. Speak my name. Bremen took a deep breath, trying to still the trembling of his limbs and the rush of cold that filled his chest. You are Galifal, that was... It was an expected part of the ritual. A spirit summoned could not remain unless his name was spoken by the summoner. Now it could stay long enough to give answers to the questions Bremen would ask, if it chose to answer at all. The shade stirred, suddenly restless. What would you know of me? Bremen did not hesitate. 
I would know wh whatever you would tell me of the rebel druid Prona, of who he, of who has become the warlock lord. His voice was shaking as badly as his hands. I would know how to destroy him. I would know what is to come. His voice died away in a dry rattle. The hazorn hissed and spit as if in response to his words, and the moans and cries of the dead rose out of the night in a strident cacophony. Bremen felt the cold stir anew in his chest, a snake coiling as it prepared to strike. He felt the whole of his years pressed down upon him. He felt the weakness of his body betray the strength of his determination. You would destroy him at any cost. Yes, you would pay any price to do so. Bremen felt the snake within spring deep into his heart. Yes, he whispered in despair. The spirit of Galafal spread its arms as if to enfold the old man, as if to shelter and protect him. Watch. Visions began to appear against the black spread of its cloaked form, taking shape within the shroud of its body. One by one, they materialized out of the darkness, vague and insubstantial, shimmering like the waters of the Hades horn with the coming of the spirits. Bremen watched the images parade before him, and he was drawn to them as to the light in darkness. There were four. In the first, he stood within the ancient fortress of Paranor. All around him, there was death. No one lived within the keep. All slain by treachery, all destroyed by wicked stealth. Blackness cloaked the castle of the druids, and blackness stirred within its shadows in the form of assassins waiting. A deadly force, but beyond that blackness shone with gleaming certainty the bright, shimmering medallion of the high druids awaiting his coming, needful of his touch. An image of a hand raised aloft with a burning torch, the cherished ilt druin. The vision vanished, and he soared now across the vast expanse of the westland. He looked down the maze, unable to account for his flight. At first he could not determine where he was. Then he recognized the lush valley of the Sarandanan and beyond. The blue expanse of the Innisbor. Clouds obscured his vision momentarily, changing everything. Then he saw mountains, the Ken's Row, or the break line. Within their mass were twin peaks, fingers of a hand split outward from each other in a V-shape. Between them, a pass led to a vast cluster of fingers, all jammed together, crushed into a single mass. Within the fingers was a fortress, hidden away, ancient, beyond imagining, a place come out of the time of fairy. Bremen swooped down into its blackness and found death waiting, though he could not spy out its face, and there within its coils lay the black elf stone. This vision vanished too, and now he stood upon the battlefield. The dead and wounded lay all about, men from all the races and things from no race known to man. Blood streaked the earth and the cries of the combatants and the clash of their weapons rain out in the fading gray light of a late afternoon sky. Before him stood a man, his face turned away. He was tall and blonde. He was an elf. He carried in his right hand a gleaming sword. Several yards farther away was the warlock lord, black-robed and terrible, an indomitable presence that challenged all. He seemed to wait on the tall man, unhurried, confident, defiant. The tall man advanced, raising high the sword, and beneath the gloved hand on the weapon's handle was the insignia of the Ilt Druin. One last vision appeared. It was dark and clouded and filled with sounds of sorrow and despair. Bremen stood once more in the Valley of Shale before the waters of the Hayshorn. He faced anew the shade of Galafau, watching as the smaller, brighter spirit swirled about it like smoke. At his side was a boy, tall and lean and dark, barely fifteen, so solemn he might have been in mourning. The boy turned to Bremen, and the druid looked into his eyes. His eyes? 
The visions faded and were gone. The shade of Galafau drew itself into a tighter coalescence, masking away the images, stealing away the brief light they had given. Bremen stared, blinking, wondering at what he had witnessed. Will these happen? He whispered to the shade. Will they come to pass? Some have come to pass already. The, the Druids? Paranor? Do not ask more. But what can I... The shade gestured, dismissing out of hand the old man's questions. Bremen caught his breath as bands of iron tightened around his chest. The bands released and he swallowed down his fear. Spray flew from the haze horn in a bright geyser, diamonds against the black velvet night. The shade began to recede. Do not forget. Bremen lifted his hand in a futile effort to slow the other's departure. Wait! A price for each. The old man shook his head in confusion. A price for each? Each what? For whom? Remember. Then the haze horn boiled anew and the ghost sank slowly back into the churning waters, drawing down with it all of the brighter, smaller spirits that had accompanied it. Down they went in a rush of spray and mist amid cries and whimpers from the dead back to the netherworld from which they had come. Water exploded in a massive column as they disappeared, breaking apart the silence and dead air in a frightening explosion. Then the storm came flooding in with wind and rain, with thunder and lightning, hammering into the old man. Bremen went down with the blow felled in an instant. Eyes open and staring, he lay senseless at the water's edge. Marif reached him first. The men were larger and stronger, but her footing was surer on the damp, slippery rock, and she fairly flew across its polished surface. She knelt immediately and cradled the old man in her arms. Rain poured down relentlessly, pocketing the now smooth, quiet surface of the hazehorn, washing down the black, glistening carpet of the valley, turning the dawn light hazy and vague. It soaked through Marib's cloak to her skin, chilling her, but she ignored it, her small features twisting in concentration. Her face lifted to the darkened skies and her eyes closed. The other three slowed as they reached her, uncertain what was happening. Her arms tightened about Bremen. Then she shuddered violently and slumped forward, and the men rushed ahead to catch her. Kinson lifted her away from Bremen, while Tay picked up the old man, and in a knot they fought their way back through the downpour and out of the valley's of shell. Once clear, they found shelter in a grotto they had passed on their way in. There they laid the girl and the old man on the stone floor and wrapped them in their cloaks. There was no wood for a fire, so they were forced to remain sodden and chilled, waiting out the rain. Kinson checked for heartbeat and pulse and found both strong. After a time, the old man came awake, then almost immediately after the girl. The three watchers crowded around Bremen to ask what had happened, but the old man shook his head and told them he did not wish to speak just yet. They left him reluctantly and moved away again. Kinson paused beside Marif, thinking to ask what she had done to Bremen, for it seemed clear that she had done something. But she glanced up at him and turned away immediately, so he abandoned the attempt. The day brightened marginally, and the rains moved on. Kinson shared the food he carried with the others. Only Bremen would not eat. The old man seemed to have retreated somewhere deep inside himself, or perhaps he was still somewhere back within the valley. Staring at nothing, he seemed weathered, face an expressionless mask. Kinson watched him for a time, searching for some sign of what he was thinking, failing in his effort to do so. Finally, the old man looked up as if just discovering they were there and wondering why, then beckoned them to sit close to him. When they were settled, he told them of his meeting with the Shade of Galifau and of the four visions he had been shown. I could not decide what the visions meant, he concluded, his voice weary and rough-edged in the silence. Were they simply prophecies of what is to come, a future already decided? Were they the promise of what might be if certain things were done? Why were these particular visions selected by the shade? 
What response is expected of me? All these questions left unanswered. What price are you being asked to pay for your involvement in all this? Kinson muttered darkly. Don't forget that one. Bremen smiled. I have asked to be involved, Kinson. I have put myself in the position of being protector of the races and destroyer of the warlock lord, and I do not have the right to ask what it will cost me if my efforts succeed. Still, he sighed, I believe I understand something now of what is required of me, but I will need help from all of you. He looked at them in turn. I must ask you to put yourselves in great danger, I'm afraid. Riska snorted. <laughs> Thank goodness. I was beginning to think nothing at all would come of this adventure. Tell us what we must do. Yes, best to get started with this journey. Tay agreed, leaning forward eagerly. Bremen nodded, gratitude reflected in his eyes. We are agreed that the warlock lore must be stopped before he subjugates all of the races. We know that he has t tried and failed once already, but that this time he is stronger and more dangerous. I told you that because of this, I believe he will attempt to destroy the druids at Paranor. The vision, the first vision suggests that I was right. He paused. I am afraid, perhaps, that it has already come to pass. There was a long silence as the others exchanged weary glass glances. And... You think the druids are all dead? Tay asked softly. Bremen nodded. I think it is a possibility. I hope I am wrong. In any event, whether they are dead or not, I must retrieve the eel druin in accordance with the first vision. The visions taken together make it clear that the medallion is the key to forging a weapon that will destroy Brona. A sword, a blade of special power, of magic that the warlock lord cannot withstand. What magic? Kenton asked at once. I don't know yet. Bremen smiled anew, shaking his head. I know hardly anything beyond the fact that a weapon is needed. And if the vision is to be believed, the weapon must be a sword. And that you must find the man who will wield it? Tay added. A man whose face you were not shown? But the last vision, the dark image of the Hatesorn and the boy with the strange eyes, Merif began worriedly. Must wait until it's time. Bremen cut her short, though not harshly. His gaze settled on her face, searching. Things reveal themselves as they will, Merif. We cannot rush them. And we cannot allow ourselves to be constrained by our concern for them. So what are you asking us to do? Tay pressed. Bremen faced him. We must separate, Tay. I want you to return to the elves and ask Cortan Belindorok to mount an expedition to search out the Black Elf Stone. In some way, the stone is critical to our efforts to destroy Brona. The visions suggest as much. The Wayne Hunters already searched for it. They must not be allowed to find it. The Elf King must be persuaded to support us in this. We have the particulars of the vision to help us. Use what it has shown us and recover the stone before the warlock lord. He turned to Riska. I need you to travel to Raber and the dwarves at Colhaven. The armies of the warlock lord march east and I believe they will strike there next. The dwarves must make themselves ready to defend against an attack and must hold until help can be sent. You must use your special skills to see that they do so. Tay will speak with Balindarok to ask the elves to join force with the dwarves. If they do so, they will be a match for the troll army that Brona relies upon. He paused. But mostly, we must gain time to forge the weapon that will destroy Brona. Kinzen, Marif, and I will return to Paranor and discover where the vision of its fall is true. I will seek to gain possession of the Illit Druin. If he still... If he still lives, Athabasca will not give it up, Riska declared. You know that, perhaps. Bremen replied mildly, in any case, I must determine how this swore and I was shown is to be forged, what magic it shall possess, what power it needs to be imbued with. 
I must discover how to make it indestructible. Then I must find its wielder. You must perform miracles, it seems to me, Tay Treffenway mused ironically. All of us must do so, Berman answered softly. They looked at each other in the gloomy light, an unspoken understanding taking shape between them. Beyond their shelter, rainwater dripped in steady cadence from the rocky outcroppings. It was a mid-morning, and the light had turned silvery and the sun sought to fight its way through the, lim the lingering storm clouds. If, if the druids at Paranor are dead, then we are all le that is left, Tay said. Just the five of us. Bremen nodded. Then five must be enough. He rose, looking out into the gloom. We had better get started. And that's basically it, guys. That was the end of chapter five. Hope y'all enjoyed it. We shall see what happens next. Wow, I don't remember his story at all, so it's pretty fun. I, I look forward to always reading it when I get back to it. Okay, guys, tell me in the comments what y'all think. And also, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you're enjoying the story and you're not already subscribed. And I want to say thank you to all who are already subscribed and any new subscribers that I have. Okay, guys, bye. <laughs>